Hi everyone, I'm Shariq, and today I present our work on Horcrux, which automatically parallelizes JavaScript computation to make better use of multi-core phones. This is a joint work with Ayush and Harsha from the University of Michigan, Rani from Harvard, and my advisor Ravi from Princeton. In the past decade, the web traffic has increasingly shifted toward mobile, and now it accounts for over half of the global web traffic. Despite this shift, one thing that has not changed is that the performance still matters in two particular ways. The first is that users are very sensitive to slow page loads. They expect pages to load under two seconds, and because of that, content providers also deeply care about delivering fast page loads as it directly affects their revenue. As recent studies have shown, one of the biggest challenges today in meeting these performance demands is the client-side computation that's required to load these pages. To better understand this, we conducted a series of experiments where we considered a set of popular and unpopular pages from developed and emerging regions, as well as phones that are popular in each one. We loaded these in a record and replay setup with live Wi-Fi and LTE networks. We considered two metrics here, page load time, that is time it takes to completely fetch and evaluate all content, as well as speed index, which is the average time to render the visible parts of the content on the screen. So in this setup, as you can see on the right, even without the network delays, the computation required for more than half of these pages typically exceeds the three second threshold that users have. So it's very important for us to reduce the computation delays if we want to meet the performance goals from earlier. So why computation delays are so significant? On the one hand, as we all know, JavaScript is more and more common in these pages. In the past five years, its presence has increased about 80%. Using the setup from earlier, we measured the fraction of time spent on JavaScript execution out of total computation time required to load a page. Our findings show that JavaScript computation is the primary contributor to overall computation time. For example, for median page in developed region, JavaScript accounts for 52% of computations. On the flip side, phone have gotten more powerful. As you can see, for our phone in the developed region, the CPU clock speed is slightly improved, but even more notable is the core counts that have doubled in the last five years, particularly to meet the energy constraints on phones. The same trend holds for our phone in emerging region. At face value, you might think that these trends cancel each other out with respect to performance. However, we find that page load performance does not actually improve much, even with increasing number of cores. To see the impact of number of CPU cores on page performance, we ran an experiment where we loaded all of our pages with different number of CPU cores enabled. As you can see, more cores does not equal better performance. And the reason has to do with the fact that JavaScript execution in the browser is single-threaded. We speculate that the main reason for single-threaded execution is that it simplifies the page development. Naturally, the solution, which is the focus of our work, is to automatically parallelize the JavaScript execution so that legacy pages can take advantage of this increasing number of CPU cores. Today, parallelizing JavaScript uh, code is feasible by using web workers, as browsers have recently added support for it. Web workers let the JavaScript engine spin up additional worker threads to perform JavaScript computation alongside the main thread. However, web workers offer constrained APIs. For example, they can access the main global state or the DOM APIs. And more importantly, the communication between the main thread and workers is via pass by value messages. Because of these limitations, the burden is on us to determine parts of code that can be safely parallelized without violating the state dependencies. Nonetheless, given this ability to parallelize certain JavaScript computation, a very natural question is how amenable are legacy web pages to such parallelization. So to answer this question, we profiled the runtime of the pages in our core pro where we maximally parallelized functions to different threads without violating any state dependencies between functions. And so the speed up results show that legacy web pages are highly amenable to such parallelism. However, there are challenges in realizing this potential. First, 
To safely parallelize JavaScript execution, we need to make sure that the original page content and behavior is preserved, meaning that we should not violate the state dependencies while offloading JavaScript execution. Even though there are multiple control flow paths that could be taken and the page could exhibit non-determinism. So our solution is to use conservative signatures for each function that list all possible state accessed by that function. To generate conservative signature for every function, we combine two different techniques. First, we use dynamic analysis, which helps us understand for a given page load, what is all the state that is accessed. But if you recall, we need to make sure that we cover all the possible control flows that can happen. So we use concolic execution, which is a variant of symbolic execution that enables us to explore all the possible control paths that a program could take. Then we perform dynamic analysis for each of these paths. More concretely, the way it works in our system is that we take the original source code and dynamically instrument it such that all the state accesses are tracked. Then we pass this into a concolic in execution engine that essentially using a headless browser explores all the potential paths. Then using the dynamic instrumentation, it spits out all the state that is accessed and then it will get aggregated into this per function conservative signature. As a concrete example here, Variable X is being read, but depending on the branch that is taken in the runtime, there is a write to either variable Y or Z. So it's important to note that the write set in our conservative signature includes both Y and Z. And of course, this whole process, both the dynamic analysis and concolic execution adds overhead uh, to the standard page load process as they're quite expensive. So importantly, with Horcrux, these tasks are computed offline and on the server. Then pages are rewritten where each function includes its signature information. And so now that we know the state accesses by each function, how do we realize parallel execution of JavaScript functions given the constraint APIs? On the client side, Horcrux employs its own JavaScript scheduling library to dynamically make parallelization decisions as well as providing the needed state in the runtime, such as number of available threads. So our custom uh, scheduler library is embedded in written, rewritten pages. So it runs in the main thread and is configured to keep the main thread as idle as possible to reduce the overheads. As a result, it runs in an event-driven manner where it listens for the new invocations that need to be made and manages the offload. In particular, in Horcrux pages, all function invocations are rewritten such that instead of directly running the source code, the invocations are sent to the scheduler. Upon receiving an invocation, the scheduler uses the signature to determine whether it can safely offload that function right away, which means the function should not have any state dependencies with something that's already running or something that already have been invoked but has not yet run and is queued because of the state dependency. To better understand how the scheduler works, let's just run through an example. In this example, the page has three functions. When each one is invoked, it doesn't run the function source code directly, but instead it simply sends a message to a scheduler that it needs to be invoked and provides its signature as well. The scheduler determines whether the function has any state dependency to other functions that are in the queue or the functions that are already running. If not, then the scheduler gets the value of the read state from the heap and the DOM. And then it sends uh, the function along with the needed state to a web worker and the execution is offloaded. So while the first function is being executed, other functions may get invoked. For example, the next function g of x may read y. Since there is a state dependency with something that's already running, it will just get added to the queue. For the next invocation, again, if it has no state dependency with any of the functions running in the web worker or in the queue, the scheduler offloads the function and the needed state to one of the available workers like before. 
And so one final note uh, is that some of these offloaded functions can access the DOM, but recall that web workers don't have access to that API. For example, if H of X accesses the DOM, the way Horcrux handles it is that it pauses the execution on the web worker and the main thread is used to mediate that a specific DOM computation. The paper describes this process in more detail. And so lastly, these offloadings does not come free. For example, passing in values could take several milliseconds depending on the size of the message. Clearly, there's trade-offs regarding the offloading. On the one hand, offloading code at finer granularity increases the parallelization benefits, while on the other hand, the relative cost of offloading grows. Our insight is that offloading at a granularity of what we call root function that balances the potential benefits with overheads. So to understand root functions better, consider a page where you have this script that function A is invoked directly from the JavaScript global scope. When A is called, it invokes B, which invokes C, and A also invokes D. Root functions are the top of the call stack. So A is the root function in this case. In Horcrux, rather than offloading each of these individual invocations, we offload the entire chain of the invocation as soon as A is invoked. We empirically find that this granularity nicely balances the trade-offs between parallelism benefits and offloading costs. In particular, for our pages, we can have 4x fewer offloads, which means much lower overheads while still getting 73% of potential benefits. And the reason which we describe in a paper in more details is that as you'd imagine, these nested functions are more likely to share a state than different call graphs, which means we are not really sacrificing significant parallelization opportunities. Okay, now that we have covered the three core insights and solutions embedded in Horcrux, let's now talk about our evaluation. To evaluate Horcrux, we use the same setup as earlier with the goal of trying to answer these five questions. However, in the interest of time, I'm only going to focus on the first two questions, though the paper has more details on other questions. To evaluate computation speedups, we compare to a default page load and consider total computation time, which is the amount of time spent on parsing and executing the source file, as well as rendering the page. Horcrux was able to provide significant computation speedups across both regions and network settings. For a median page in developed region, we see 41% improvements on a live LT network, which translates to one second less computation time. We also provide similar improvements for end-to-end -end metrics, such as page load time and speed index that I have mentioned before. For example, on Wi-Fi network, we see 27% and 29% improvements for PLT in developed and emerging regions respectively. And so with this, I conclude Horcrux is open source. I encourage you to check it out and email us with questions. Now I'm happy to take your question. Thank you.